Letting Go, The Pathway of Surrender by David Hawkins Surrender is often misconceived as a sign of weakness or defeat, when in reality it represents a profound shift in how one relates to life itself. The act of surrender is not the act of giving in, but rather of giving up, not the relinquishing of one's power, but a redirection of it. In this reorientation, you're not losing control, you're ceasing the futile attempt to control the uncontrollable. Surrender is essentially a process of unburdening. Imagine holding a weight in your outstretched hand indefinitely. No matter how light the weight, over time it becomes unbearable. Your muscles start to quiver, your hand droops, and eventually, you are forced to put it down or risk injuring yourself. The tension that accrues in your life be it emotional, psychological, or even physical, accumulates in a similar manner. The longer you hold on to it, the more it exhausts you. Surrender allows you to put down that weight, granting your muscles, the very fibers of your being, the reprieve they so desperately need. The real question then is not why surrender, but why resist. What mechanisms in your psyche instigate this opposition to life's flow? Resistance acts like a dam, disrupting the free passage of experiences and emotions, eventually causing stagnation. The act of surrender demolishes this dam, allowing life to flow freely. This liberation doesn't just remove the barriers you've placed against the world, but also those you've erected against yourself. Surrender also functions as a lens through which to view life, offering a different focal length than the lens of control. Control seeks to zoom in, focusing on minute details, hoping to manipulate variables to one's advantage. Surrender, on the other hand, widens the view, taking in life's grandiosity and interconnectedness. When you zoom out, you realize that so many things are not only out of your control, but are also interconnected in complex ways that are beyond any individual's capacity to manipulate. The pathway of surrender is an experiential journey, an ongoing commitment to meet life with openness rather than trepidation. It's a commitment to adaptability and acceptance, which paradoxically opens doors that seemed firmly shut. This doesn't mean you become passive, far from it. In the absence of resistance, your actions become expressions of your highest self, rather than reactions fueled by fear or anger. Surrender, then, is not a single event, but a continuous, evolving relationship with life. It's not a static state, but a dynamic flow, constantly adjusting and readjusting as circumstances require. It is the essence of flexibility and the epitome of freedom. It's a conscious act, nay, a conscious art, of harmonizing your will with the grander orchestration of existence, a harmonization that does not diminish your role but enriches it immeasurably. The belief in control is one of the most pervasive and misleading constructs that humans adhere to. We're raised to think that mastery over our environment is not just possible, but also desirable. This notion has given rise to significant advancements in technology, medicine, and quality of life. But it has also created a fallacy that we can and should exert control over all aspects of existence. What we often fail to see is that control is a double-edged sword. On one edge, control represents human ingenuity and advancement. On the other, it gives rise to an illusion, one that causes undue stress and even suffering. The craving for control is not merely the desire for order or predictability, but often a deeply seated need to avert vulnerability. We think that if we can control all variables, we can negate the possibility of pain, failure, or loss. This is a myth. The paradox of control is that the more we try to control, the more out of control we often feel. 
This happens because the scope of what we can genuinely control is vastly overshadowed by what we can't. Efforts to dominate our surroundings often lead to unintended consequences, ranging from minor inconveniences to significant upheavals. We may control a variable here, only to cause a ripple effect of unpredictability there. Even if we do manage to control one aspect of a situation, many others remain outside our grasp, forever subject to change. Take, for example, the human endeavor to control nature. We build dams to control water flow and generate electricity. While this achieves a specific aim, it also disrupts ecosystems, displaces communities, and alters landscapes in ways that are often irreversible. Here, the illusion of control manifests in our failure to account for the broader, interconnected systems in which we operate. Our focus narrows, and we mistake the part for the whole. The illusion extends to interpersonal relationships as well. How often do we try to control the thoughts, feelings, or actions of others? Yet, even with the most earnest attempts, people remain enigmatic and unpredictable. By trying to control them, we may, in fact, alienate them or stifle the organic growth of the relationship. Control, when applied to human interaction, can act as a constricting force that suppresses the natural flow of human emotion and connection. Accepting that control is an illusion doesn't imply aimlessness or apathy. Instead, it calls for a recalibration of perspective. Rather than wasting energy on futile attempts to manipulate circumstances, focus on what can genuinely be influenced. Your reactions, your mindset, and your approach to challenges. Here lies a more constructive form of control, one that is internal rather than external. Disavowing the misconception of control is liberating. It frees up emotional and cognitive resources, allowing you to engage with life in a more meaningful way. When you no longer see yourself as the puppet master, frantically pulling strings to keep the show going, you can step back and appreciate the narrative that unfolds, finding your unique role within that larger story. It's a shift from being a stress director to becoming a conscious participant in the complex, ever-changing theater of existence. The emotional landscape of human experience is not just a byproduct of events and circumstances. It serves as a complex filter through which we perceive and interpret reality. Your emotional state at any given moment serves as a lens, altering not just what you see but how you see it. It's not merely a reactive mechanism, but a proactive framework that governs your interactions with the world. We often categorize emotions as positive or negative, convenient or inconvenient, yet this binary understanding falls short of capturing their transformative power. Emotions are not just transient states to be managed. They are reflective indicators of your cognitive environment. If you find yourself consistently in a state of fear, anxiety, or anger, it's not just your mood that's affected. Your perception of reality becomes contracted. In these lower emotional states, the world appears as a battleground, fraught with threats and challenges. Your capacity for complexity diminishes, your decision-making narrows, and your actions often serve immediate survival rather than long-term fulfillment. On the other end of the spectrum, emotions like love, joy, and gratitude don't just make you feel good. They expand your cognitive field. In higher emotional states, the world transforms from a battleground to a playground, or even a learning ground. Your perception is broadened, your intellect sharpens, and your decisions and actions are geared toward growth contribution, and meaningful connection. In this state, you are not merely reacting to the world. You are co-creating your experience of it. This isn't to say that you should repress negative emotions or artificially induce positive ones. Emotional states are fluid and respond to a myriad of factors, many of which are beyond your immediate control. 
The key is not to force a different emotional state, but to understand the state you are in. Understanding equips you with the capacity to shift your emotional state by altering your interpretations, responses, or environments. For instance, if you are feeling stressed or anxious, acknowledging these emotions and their constrictive influence allows you to question their basis. Is the threat real or perceived? Is the challenge insurmountable? Or does it merely appear that way through the lens of the current emotional state? By questioning, you create space, mental and emotional room to maneuver. Within this space, the possibility of a different emotional reality emerges. So, in essence, your emotional reality serves as both a map and a compass. It tells you where you are and points you in the direction of where you could go. It's not something to escape from but to engage with. A nuanced understanding of your emotional reality doesn't just provide you with a psychological advantage. It becomes a tool for navigating the broader complexities of life itself. It allows you to move from being an emotional bystander, subject to the whims of circumstance, to becoming an emotional architect, capable of constructing a more adaptive, expansive, and fulfilling life experience. The power of letting go is often underappreciated because it contradicts the conventional wisdom that equates strength with accumulation, with holding on. We're often taught that acquiring more, whether it's material wealth, skills, or even relationships, leads to happiness and success. However, the unspoken truth is that the act of letting go can be equally, if not more, empowering. Letting go is not about discarding or devaluing. It's about making space. Think of it as pruning a tree. By removing the dead or overcrowded branches, you're not weakening the tree but strengthening it. You allow it to focus its energy on growing new branches, leaves, and fruit. In a similar way, letting go enables you to allocate your resources more effectively, directing them toward what truly matters and away from what no longer serves you. Letting go also dismantles the emotional fortresses we construct around ourselves. These fortresses may offer the illusion of security, but they also isolate us from authentic experiences. By putting up barriers to protect ourselves from potential pain or loss, we inadvertently also block out joy, love, and the enriching experiences that come from vulnerability and openness. The act of letting go is, in a way, an act of profound courage. It entails confronting our fears and insecurities and choosing to engage with life in a more authentic manner. Moreover, letting go liberates you from the psychological burden of attachment. The things we hold on to often occupy mental and emotional space, acting as constant reminders of our fears, insecurities, and unfulfilled desires. These attachments don't just weigh us down physically. They limit our cognitive and emotional bandwidth, restricting our capacity to perceive and engage with new opportunities. Letting go is akin to clearing the cache in a computer. It improves performance and allows for more efficient operation. The unique aspect of letting go is that it's both an internal and external process. Internally, it involves changing your relationship with your thoughts, emotions, and self-narratives. Externally, it may involve changing your relationship with people, objects, or environments that are sources of friction or disharmony. Often, the external change follows the internal one. Once you change your internal relationship with something, its external impact on you naturally diminishes. One of the most transformative dimensions of letting go is its capacity to alter your experience of time. When you're holding on to past resentments, future anxieties, or present frustrations, your temporal experience becomes fragmented. Letting go harmonizes your temporal experience. The past, present, and future no longer act as conflicting forces, but flow seamlessly into one another. 
You move from experiencing time as a linear sequence to understanding it as a unified field in which you are continuously participating. Resistance is your enemy in the process of surrender. Whether it's against situations, emotions, or people, resistance binds you to the object of your resistance. What you resist persists. Acknowledging inner resistance is an act of cognitive and emotional transparency that is fundamental to personal growth. Resistance manifests when there is a gap between what you instinctively feel and what you consciously aspire to do or become. This gap is not merely a sign of internal conflict. It's an invitation to delve deeper into your own complexities. When resistance surfaces, it's often an automatic, reflexive response to some perceived threat or discomfort. It's as if your psyche deploys it as a defense mechanism to protect you from potential harm, whether that harm is physical, emotional, or psychological. However, the irony is that resistance frequently perpetuates the very conditions it aims to shield you from. For instance, the resistance to confront an issue often leads to the exacerbation of the problem, rendering the defense mechanism counterproductive. Inner resistance is also a signal that you are at the cusp of a transition, be it small or significant. It operates as a boundary marker between your comfort zone and the unknown terrain that lies beyond. Therefore, Acknowledging this resistance doesn't just reveal what you're hesitant about, it highlights what you're approaching. A threshold of change, learning, or personal evolution. However, acknowledgement is not synonymous with acquiescence. Recognizing inner resistance doesn't mean you should immediately yield to it. It means you give yourself the opportunity to scrutinize it. Why is the resistance there? What is it guarding against? Is the perceived threat real or a misjudgment? These questions serve as cognitive probes that can unearth layers of insights about your fears, expectations, and underlying beliefs. The dynamics of inner resistance can also be deeply rooted in your psychological history. Sometimes, what you resist may be linked to past experiences, conditioning, or trauma. In such instances, the acknowledgement of resistance becomes the first step in a deeper therapeutic process, aimed not merely at overcoming the immediate resistance, but also at addressing its origins. The act of acknowledging inner resistance can also catalyze shifts in your emotional landscape. Resistance is often accompanied by emotions like frustration, anxiety, or shame. These emotions cloud judgment, and constrict your decision-making framework. When you acknowledge the resistance, you also acknowledge these accompanying emotions, allowing them to be processed rather than suppressed. This can lead to emotional alleviation and a clearer cognitive space in which to operate. By facing inner resistance head-on, you're also empowering yourself to make informed choices you become capable of opting for actions that are aligned with your higher values rather than being reactively dictated by your resistance. This alignment brings congruence into your actions and decisions, making your life not just more coherent, but also more meaningful. Every moment presents a choice to let go or to hold on. These moments are the stepping stones to greater freedom. You can choose to act from a place of surrender or from resistance. The moment of surrender is not when life is over, it's when it begins. The concept of conscious choice is pivotal in shaping the trajectory of human experience. It serves as the fulcrum between internal states and external outcomes, bridging the gap between thought and action, intention and manifestation. On the surface, making the choice seems like a straightforward act often reduced to selecting between given options. However, the depth and breadth of conscious choice reach far beyond mere selection. They encompass the very architecture of your life. When we talk about conscious choice, we're not just discussing decision-making, but the quality of awareness brought to the decision-making process. 
A conscious choice is not reactive but reflective. It isn't a knee-jerk response to immediate stimuli, but a deliberate act informed by an alignment of values, goals, and contextual understanding. It rises above instinctual drives and circumstantial pressures, allowing you to steer your actions according to a broader life vision. The power of conscious choice lies in its ability to break the cycle of habitual responses. We all have ingrained habits and automatic reactions shaped by past experiences, cultural conditioning, and biological predispositions. While these automated patterns can be efficient, they are not always effective, especially when faced with novel or complex situations. Conscious choice serves as an interruption to this automation, offering a momentary pause in which you can reassess the situation, evaluate your options, and then act. One fascinating aspect of conscious choice is its relationship with responsibility. When you make a conscious choice, you're not just deciding for the present moment. You're also assuming responsibility for the consequences that arise from that choice. This is empowering because responsibility provides a sense of agency, a realization that you are the primary architect of your life structure. It shifts your orientation from being a passive recipient of life circumstances to an active participant in shaping your destiny. Conscious choice also has a significant impact on your cognitive and emotional well-being. When you make choices consciously, there's a congruence between your actions and your values. This alignment minimizes cognitive dissonance, the psychological discomfort that arises from holding conflicting beliefs or values. Furthermore, it enhances emotional integrity as your actions resonate with your inner sense of self leading to increased self-esteem and self-efficacy. One of the often overlooked dimensions of conscious choice is its collective impact. Every individual choice contributes to a network of choices that collectively shape societal norms, cultural values, and even historical changes. When more individuals make conscious choices, the ripple effects can lead to significant shifts in collective behavior creating communities and societies that are more reflective, ethical, and harmonious. Conscious choice is not a static skill, but a dynamic competency. It evolves as you acquire more knowledge, experience, and wisdom. It adapts to the complexities and uncertainties that characterize human life. Its role is not to eliminate challenges, but to equip you with the cognitive and emotional tools to navigate them in a manner that aligns with your highest aspirations. You often operate on autopilot, following subconscious programs that have been instilled over a lifetime. Recognizing these patterns is the first step towards changing them. Awareness is the key to unlocking potential. Subconscious programs operate like the underlying code in a complex software system. They're not visible on the surface, but govern the operations and responses of the entire system. In humans, these programs are the accumulation of learned behaviors, ingrained beliefs, and repeated experiences that have settled into the backdrop of the mind. They influence how you react to stimuli, interact with others, and even how you perceive yourself. Recognizing these subconscious programs is a formidable task, yet it's vital for anyone seeking to achieve a higher level of self-awareness and autonomy. In the context of human psychology, the subconscious programs are often the product of early life experiences, cultural background, social norms, and even evolutionary predispositions. They act like filters, determining what information gets attention and how it is processed. For instance, if you were brought up in an environment where emotional expression was discouraged, your subconscious program may automatically suppress emotional responses, even when it's counterproductive to do so. Identifying these programs begins with observing discrepancies between your intentions and outcomes. You may find that despite your best efforts, Certain patterns continue to manifest in your life. 
patterns that are misaligned with your goals or values. These recurring patterns are clues pointing toward the operating subconscious programs. Scrutinizing these patterns through introspection or even therapeutic practices can expose the hidden algorithms of your subconscious. Recognizing your subconscious programs is not just about diagnosing them. It's about understanding their purpose. In many cases, these programs were developed as coping mechanisms. They served a function at some point, often providing an adaptive advantage or emotional protection. Thus, they are not inherently negative or positive but contextual. What was adaptive in one phase of life could become maladaptive in another, and this discord creates internal friction. Once you identify a subconscious program, the next challenge is to rewrite it, akin to debugging or updating software. However, altering subconscious programs is not as straightforward as flipping a switch. Since these programs are deeply entrenched, they often resist modification. Conscious effort, repeated conditioning, and sometimes professional guidance are required to revise them. Techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness practices, and even biofeedback methods can be employed to recondition these programs. Another layer of complexity is the interconnectedness of subconscious programs. Changing one might inadvertently affect another, as they often function as part of a larger network of beliefs and behaviors. Therefore, tweaking one aspect of your subconscious landscape can lead to a chain reaction of internal shifts. While this can be unsettling, it is also an opportunity for comprehensive self-improvement and transformation. In the broader scope, Identifying and modifying your subconscious programs is not merely a personal endeavor, but a collective imperative. Your subconscious programs not only determine your individual actions, but contribute to collective human behavior. As more people engage in this profound internal work, the potential for societal transformation escalates. Discovering and understanding your subconscious programs is vital to gaining control over your inner workings. It lays the foundation for effectively managing and optimizing your internal architecture, ultimately leading to personal mastery and growth. This mastery enables you to navigate life not as a mere respondent to external stimuli, but as an autonomous entity capable of deliberate action and meaningful interaction. It's akin to gaining access to the control room of your existence, where you can adjust the settings to better align with your aspirations, complexities, and the ever-changing nuances of life. All experiences, good or bad, are fleeting. Accepting this impermanence reduces suffering and enhances joy. Life flows effortlessly when we stop swimming against the current. The transience of human experience is a concept that, paradoxically, is both unsettling and liberating. On one hand, the ever-changing nature of life can evoke a sense of vulnerability. The people we love, the pursuits that engross us, even our own identities, are not fixed points but variables in a constantly shifting equation. On the other hand, the impermanent nature of existence provides a profound freedom, offering endless possibilities for growth, change, and renewal. Transience operates on multiple levels. At the most basic, we experience it physically. Our bodies undergo continuous processes of renewal and decay, leading us through various stages of life each with its unique set of capacities and limitations. But transience is not restricted to the physical realm. It extends to our emotional states, our intellectual perspectives, and even our social constructs. Emotions like happiness, sorrow, anger, or love are not permanent landmarks, but fluctuating experiences that ebb and flow. Intellectually, the ideas and beliefs that seem irrefutable at one stage of life may appear limited or naive at another. This intellectual transience is not a mark of inconsistency,
but a testament to the evolving nature of human understanding. The transience of collective beliefs can be even more dramatic, with entire societal norms and values undergoing transformation within the span of a single generation. As you come to understand yourself better, your ability to relate to others also improves. You become more adept at recognizing the motivations and emotions of those around you, leading to more meaningful and empathetic interactions. This relational improvement is not just limited to personal relationships, but extends to your engagement with society at large. Self-inquiry provides a framework for integrating various aspects of your life into a cohesive whole. It allows you to see the connections between your physical health, emotional well-being, intellectual pursuits, and spiritual inclinations. By recognizing these interconnections, you can make more holistic decisions, which in turn leads to a more balanced and fulfilling life. In the grand scope of things, self-inquiry is more than a practice. It's a lifetime commitment to the ongoing project of self-understanding and self-creation. It positions you not as a passive receiver of life's circumstances, but as an active participant in shaping your destiny. It instills a sense of both humility and grandeur. Humility in acknowledging the limitations of your current understanding and grandeur in recognizing your potential for growth, transformation, and influence. Through self-inquiry, you become an architect of your own being, sculpting your character and life path with the chisel of conscious awareness. Detach from the drama of life and become an observer. This doesn't mean you disconnect from life, but rather engage with it more fully. You witness experiences without getting entangled. In the eyes of the observer lies the observed. Becoming the observer in your own life involves adopting a mental stance where you disengage from immediate reactions to observe your thoughts, feelings, and actions from a detached standpoint. This is not an exercise in aloofness or emotional suppression. Rather, it's a method for gaining insights into the intricacies of your mental landscape. When you step back and become an observer, you cultivate the ability to witness your experiences without being ensnared by them. This observational stance is beneficial for several reasons. For one, it gives you the distance needed to assess situations more objectively. When you're deeply embroiled in an emotional or cognitive cycle, it's difficult to evaluate its rationality or its alignment with your values. Observing your reactions from a distance allows you to gauge them against broader principles, facilitating more reasoned decisions. The observer role is also instrumental in breaking the cycle of habitual behaviors or thought patterns. When you observe yourself impartially, you can identify recurring themes in your behavior. Recognizing these patterns is the first step in altering them. Until you see them clearly, any effort to change will likely be misdirected. Observing provides the clarity needed for effective transformation. Being an observer also enriches emotional intelligence. By distancing yourself from immediate reactions, you can dissect your emotional responses to understand their origins and implications better. This can significantly improve your self-awareness and, by extension, your interpersonal skills. Understanding your emotional triggers and behavioral tendencies can make you more adept at navigating social interactions and relationships. Furthermore, the act of observing serves as a grounding mechanism. In moments of acute stress or emotional turbulence, the observer perspective can anchor you preventing you from being swept away by the intensity of the experience. It offers a mental sanctuary, a place of calm from where you can strategize your next steps. On a deeper level, adopting the observer role confronts you with questions about the nature of self and consciousness. If you can observe your thoughts, then your thoughts are not all that you are. You begin to distinguish between the content of your consciousness and consciousness itself. 
This is an entry point into deeper philosophical or spiritual explorations about the nature of self, awareness, and existence. Moreover, the observer stance is not static but dynamic. As you practice it, you'll find that your capacity for observation deepens. Initial observations about surface-level behaviors or reactions may evolve into insights about deep-seated beliefs, motivations, or fears. Over time, you become more skillful in wielding this observational stance, applying it in increasingly nuanced ways to various aspects of your life. Being an observer also enables you to appreciate the transience of experiences. As you watch your thoughts and feelings come and go, you internalize the impermanent nature of your mental states. This can cultivate a sense of emotional resilience and philosophical equanimity. Understanding the fleeting nature of thoughts and emotions can alleviate suffering and augment joy as you learn to fully engage with each moment's offerings. Becoming the observer, then, serves as both a personal and transpersonal endeavor. On a personal level, it fosters self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and cognitive flexibility. On a transpersonal level, it opens doors to philosophical inquiry and spiritual growth. By embracing this dual role, you learn to navigate the complex terrains of internal and external reality with greater adeptness, evolving continuously as both an individual and a member of the broader human collective. In summary, surrender isn't about giving up control but about embracing a larger, more encompassing view of existence. It's a continuous process of letting go of resistance, making conscious choices, and elevating your emotional state. Through awareness and self-inquiry, you rise to become the observer of your life engaging more fully with the transient experiences it offers.